I'd like to take your, have you take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 6. While you're turning there, somebody shared with me a, uh, um, oh, what do you call those? One of those mail things that you're supposed to chain letter, you're supposed to send on and on. So I thought I'd share it with you. It says, results of a computerized survey show that the perfect pastor preaches exactly 15 minutes, condemns sin, but never upsets anyone. He works from 8 a.m. until midnight and is also the janitor. He makes $60 per week, wears good clothes, buys good books, drives a good car, and gives about $50 per week to the poor. He is 28 years old and has been preaching for 30 years. <clears throat> he is wonderfully gentle and handsome. He has a burning desire to work with teenagers and spends all his spare time with senior citizens. The perfect pastor smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his work. He makes 15 calls a day on church families, shut-ins, and hospitalized, spends all of his time evangelizing the unchurched, and is always in his office when needed. If your pastor does not measure up, simply send this letter to six other churches that are tired of their pastor too. Then bundle up your pastor and send him to the church at the top of the list. In one year, you will receive 1,643 pastors. One of them should be perfect. Warning, keep this letter going. One church broke the chain and got its old pastor back in less than three months. <laughs> Just thought I'd share that with you so you don't end up with me in three months. Uh, I know this is, uh, is my last Sunday, officially anyway, uh, and I've really kind of labored over what, what to preach today. Uh, first of all, I know there's no such thing as a perfect sermon. Jesus took care of all of those. Uh, and uh, so I had to give up on that. I thought about preaching on John 3.16 because I always love to share the gospel uh, but that's most of the time like preaching to the choir around here. So I decided to share a verse with you that means a lot to me. And the more I studied it, the more I learned from it. Uh, and hopefully it will be a help to you today. It's Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, which is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Let's bow. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you that it gives us instructions. Unfortunately, a lot of times, like the people in Jeremiah's day, we don't listen and we don't do what you've told us to do. Lord, I pray that you would help this church because this is my family, uh, Lord, and I love these folks dearly. And I want them to understand the importance of staying in the old paths. I'd ask you, Lord, to, to just touch their hearts. Help them to see the blessings that come from it and what happens when you don't. Uh, as you just speak to us today, in your precious name, amen. I, uh, I am not a big fanatic reader of Dr. Seuss. I don't have little kids anymore. Uh, but there was one that I remembered, uh, a little poem called A Zode in the Road. Uh, and I want to share it with you. I think you'll understand why when we get going here. But folks usually assumed that the word zode is something that Dr. Seuss made up. He was good at that. He'd just make up words. But apparently, what seemed like a nonsensical word was used after a lot of research. Zode, Z-O-A-D, comes from a Greek word that means stair step or ladder. Uh, it indicates a device that people use to get somewhere. Uh, so I want you to listen with that insight uh, into this poem. Did I ever tell you about the young zode who came to a sign at the fork in the road? He looked one way and the other way too. The zode had to make up his mind what to do. Well, the zode scratched his head and his chin and his pants, and he said to himself, I'll be taking a chance. If I go to place one, that place may be hot, so how will I know if I like it or not? On the other hand, though, I, I'll feel such a fool if I go to place two and find that it's cool. In that case, I may catch a chill and turn blue. So place one may be best and not place two. Play safe, cried the Zoe. I'll play safe. I'm no dunce. I'll simply start off to both places at once. And that's how the Zoe, who would not take a chance, went no place at all with a split in his pants. <laughs> Poor Zoe couldn't make up his mind which way to go, so he decided not to make a decision. Instead, he tried to take both roads at the same time. 
But folks, not making a decision is actually making a decision. Uh, and in the long run, it's going to hurt you. Because he wouldn't take a chance, he went no place at all with a split in his pants. Have you ever had trouble deciding which way to go? Uh, even with GPSs, I've learned not to trust them. Uh, they come up with some really dumb directions sometimes, and they've got me lost more times than I like to think. Uh, I still have one. I'm not sure why, except he gives me something to talk back to besides my wife. Uh, and it doesn't work when I talk back to my wife, so I can talk back to this thing, and it doesn't, doesn't come back at me. Uh, I know that there's times when all of us have to make a decision about what direction to take. And eventually, if it's an important enough decision, we have to make a choice. Well, this church is going to have to make some choices. Uh, and those choices sometimes are going to be hard. Sometimes they're going to be, be easy. But in the Bible, God is constantly telling his people to decide, to make a decision. For instance, uh, in Joshua 24, 15, Joshua challenged the Israelites to choose ye this day whom ye will serve. And then he tells them, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So whether it's popular or not, we're going to serve the Lord. A couple hundred years later, on Mount Carmel, Elijah went before the people, and he said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. Uh, if Baal be God, follow him. In other words, make up your mind. Uh, make a choice. Make a decision. Why? Because not to decide is to decide. It, it is a decision. In today's text, <clears throat> we find Jeremiah telling the people of Israel to make a decision. Stand ye in the ways. Notice that. And see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Just like the Zode, God is telling his people, you're at a crossroads. You have to decide which way to go. You've got to make a decision. Uh, because eternity hangs in the balance, and actually the future of this church hangs in the balance. Now, I realize that for a lot of pastors, uh, a church is just a job. If I'd only been here three years, five years, that's probably going to be true. But because I've been here almost 30 years, like it or not, you're my family. Uh, you're just about all I have, besides my own kids. Uh, and you're my family. We've gone through sorrow together. We've gone through happiness together. We've been up some mountains and down some valleys. Uh, and we've been there through just about everything you can imagine. And uh, so what this church does and the decisions it makes in the future uh, are either going to make me happy or, or they're going to destroy me. Uh, and uh, because I've spent 30 years trying to lead us the right way. Now, the days of Jeremiah's ministry, the people of Israel, were days of really deep spiritual wickedness. In fact, the people had sinned against God to the point where God just says, that's it, judgment is coming. And he's ready to give them up into captivity. In fact, in just a few short years after this is written, they are taken into captivity and hauled off to Babylon. And yet, while they're perched on the edge of judgment, the Lord still wants them to return back to him. Now, I look at that and I realize that in America today, we're much like the Israelites then. We're living in a time of wickedness. We're living in a time where sin uh, is supposed to be acceptable. Uh, we're living in a time where we're told that you can do anything you want and you just have to like it. Uh, and you have to take it. Uh, and we're living in a time when they're telling us we don't want to hear the Bible. We don't want to talk to you Christians. You people are hindering progress. Uh, and they're, they're coming out after us. And we can do what the Israelites did and what a lot of Christians are doing. We can give in. And we can act like the rest of the world. We can turn our church into a nightclub. Uh, I mean, we can do what everybody else is doing uh, if you want to do that. But you need to understand that's not the way to God's blessings. In this verse, you're kind of given the image of a traveler who comes to a fork in the road. He has the opportunity to go any way he desires, but God tells him to ask for the old paths, the good way. Uh, and said, instead of going blindly on, stop and ask directions and take the old paths. Why? Because he wants, the, wants him to travel the right path. He wants him on a path that's going to lead in God's direction. Now, this is a word of correction to the people. And yet, it's a lesson, I believe, for the modern church today. 
Uh, it's my opinion that the Lord still wants his people to stand in the old paths. Uh, there are, are some really good reasons for that. I'm going to share them with you this morning uh, and why you, maybe you don't like it, but uh, still you need to know what God has to say. I want you to know there's a right path and that there's a wrong path. And I want you to understand we've taken the path that we've taken for a biblical reason. We want God's blessings. We've got to be sure we're walking on the path that God has ordained, the way that He can bless and that He can honor. So I want you to notice three things with me this morning. First of all, there's a spiritual requirement here. The command that God is issuing to His people is not to allow themselves to be led astray by the false prophets and the false leaders of their day. They're instead to look back to men like Abraham uh, and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and others uh, who walk in the path of obedience. Uh, and they walked in the path of holiness before the Lord. And he says, you are to seek that path, uh, what, the way the old folks did it. Uh, now, I know younger generations can't stand old people. I actually used to be a younger generation at one time. Uh, and even back then, I was a little bit old for my time. Uh, I was sharing with the deacons back in the, the late 60s, early 70s. I was a youth pastor. And the big thing then was rock music in the church. And I would have none of it. Uh, I wouldn't bring it into the church. I refused to do it. And you know what? It ran its cycle. Uh, and it was gone. They came back to the hymns. Same thing's going to happen. Why not just stay on the good path? Uh, you know, why not stay on the right path? Now, there's nothing wrong with new songs. Uh, and I've told you that time and time again. And we've done some things. We've got a, we got a projector. We're really modern, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> uh, we got a projector. Uh, and, and we sing some new songs because I don't think God quit uh, giving people songs. Uh, I, you know, that's fine. You can sing new songs. But I just don't think you want to bring the world uh, into the church. You know why? You cannot improve on God's methods. God says we're to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, songs that lift him up, that glorify him. Now, God's command is not just that they go, but that they take the right path, that well-worn path, that old path that represents the best way. One of the problems that Israel faced is really a problem that's been faced down through the centuries. During World War II, uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, there was a group of German soldiers who dressed themselves in the uniforms of the Allies. Uh, and these German soldiers used American military vehicles, and they went through the German countryside changing the signs uh, so that our soldiers would get lost and go off in the wrong direction. This deception by the Germans almost gave them the victory uh, in that very decisive battle during the Second World War. Now, just like those Germans caused confusion and death, by changing a few signs, a lot of folks in our day are leading millions off into hell because they're changing some of the road signs of the faith. There are a lot of folks who look like Christians that are trying to change the road signs today. I mean, we face all kinds of issues. Uh, we face issues like uh, the King James. Uh, and you know where I stand on that. I've stood there for years and years. I'm not going to change now. Uh, and there's really no reason for it. Nobody's proven to me the King James is wrong. Uh, and it seems to be the best translation we've got. I'm sticking to it. Uh, and, and music becomes a problem. The necessity of the blood of Jesus. I heard a preacher on TV the other night saying that Jesus wants to save you. You need to become his best friend. You just come and tell him you love him. That's all it takes. Nothing about the blood. Nothing about sin. Nothing about forgiveness. You just come and tell Jesus you love him. Uh, and that's it. Why? Because they've thrown out the blood. Things that are immoral are now being forced upon us as acceptable. How we respond to those things is going to determine the direction and future, not just of this church, but of Christianity in America. What are the old paths? The old paths are when God was worshipped, and Christ was exalted, and the Holy Ghost was followed. The old paths are when the Bible was believed and not corrected. When sinners got saved and converts actually got converted. And the gospel was preached and not just shared. Those were the days when, and I can remember this, we'd go witnessing with tears. We prayed a lot and didn't talk very much on the phone. We spent more time on the Bible and in the Bible than we did on TV. We'd weep about lost souls. We'd enjoy, enjoyed going to church more than anything. 
We had testimonies and song services. We'd really try uh, to, to sing and do something for God. We'd actually say amen to the truth. Uh, and we'd go to the altar and repent of sin. We'd bring folks to church. We'd bring our tithes and offerings gladly. We would seek the will of God in everything and stand against sin anytime and anywhere. Those were the old paths. And folks, they still work. They still work. They're not out of date. But it, here's the problem. It takes too much commitment for most folks because they want an easy Christianity. They want an acceptable Christianity, something the rest of the world's going to buy into. Regardless of which signs the world changes, though, it doesn't change the road. There's still only one road. The Word of God is settled in heaven. And God has given us the old paths, and there's no question about what way is the right way, because God's requirements have not changed. I remember a few years, several years back probably, uh, we used to have all-night prayer meetings and, and even had uh, a prayer meeting on Saturday night. Guys would come over here about uh, 10 o'clock, 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and we'd pray uh, for an hour or so. And I remember at one of those prayer meetings, there was about six or seven of us here, uh, and we were praying, and, uh, and we were praying for souls, and uh, all of us, by the time we got done, and we were weeping. Uh, over the lost. And uh, I was thinking last night, when's the last time we've wept over the lost? You know what the funny thing was? That next Sunday, we had 16 people come forward to get saved because we wept. I have people say, soul winning doesn't work anymore. It works. The problem is we don't weep before we go. Uh, the weeping's a, a major part of it. We've got to be burdened for it. We don't want to do it. We want shortcuts to everything. I mean, we've got TV dinners and microwave everything, you know, uh, and we can eat it in two minutes instead of having to wait for it to cook. Uh, and we just want everything solved right away. But God doesn't work that way. God has a plan, and His plan works, and His timing works. Now, let me show you something else I learned as I look at this. There's a reward that's promised. God's promise to those who walk in His paths is that they'll find rest for their souls. That is, in His paths, we can be assured of three truths. First of all, we can be sure we will arrive at the right destination. When we take the Lord's highway, it's going to end in His presence. You can know that. When you follow God and you obey Him and you follow the Word of God, you're going to end up in His presence. So you know, no matter what your GPS or everybody else says, you're headed in the right direction, you're going to end up in His presence. Secondly, we can travel in safety knowing that the Lord is guarding our way. Not only are we going to end up where we want to be, but we're going to get there in the safest, most peaceful manner possible. God says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to be there for you. And we can know that while we're on the Lord's path, the deepest needs of our soul will be met. There's going to be fellowship with him. There's going to be joy in his presence at the end of the way. God tells us that we can not worry about it. You know, one of the neat things about when you walk close to God is that you just sense his presence. And you find yourself talking to him without even bowing your head sometimes. Uh, you know, when I, I drive alone in the car, I talk to him a lot because I need his help. My wife will vouch for that especially while I'm driving. Uh, and uh, uh, so I talk to the Lord, Lord, get me there, keep me safe, watch over me, uh, and I'll talk about things. And, and uh, I, I learned several years ago when I pray in the morning not to say amen. Just keep tossing up sentences here and there, talking to the Lord, and say amen when I go to bed. Uh, you know, just keep that prayer going without ceasing uh, and talking to Him. But there's an amazing thing that happens when you're in the Word and you're talking to Him in prayer, and suddenly you just realize He's right there. He's right there with you. Now, now you can't see him, but you can sense him. Uh, and you know his presence. He said, you know, if you take the right way, you never have to worry about that. I'm always going to be there. I'm always going to guide you. I'm always going to be there for you. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to watch over you. Uh, people who don't know me very well, and very few do except my wife, um, know that if anybody wanted to go the easy way, it would be me. I'm always looking for shortcuts, uh, especially if it involves less work. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I've been working on trying to invent, you know, they've got these vacuum cleaners. Now you just turn it on, it goes itself. I want to invent, invent a riding lawnmower like that, that I don't even have to ride. 
just push a button and it goes and mows the yard. Uh, you know, that's the easy way out. Uh, however, getting out there and mowing it is, is, is work. And uh, you got to be committed to it. You got to take care of it. Uh, and you got to do it. Well, the Christian life is like that. You've got to be committed to it. If you're not committed to it, you're not going to get God's blessings. You're not going to see God work. You're not going to see Him there. Uh, but He meets the deepest needs of our souls. However, those who fail to follow God in the old paths will walk in destruction in misery. And that's what happened to Israel. They would not follow God. They would not follow the old paths. And God led them into captivity. You know, when you turn your backs on the right way, the way God has chosen, you're going to find the road is difficult. There's no peace. There's no safety. And the destination is just always in question. There's a reward for those who walk in the right paths. God's promised it. He will be with you. Uh, he will guide you. He will help you. Thirdly, unfortunately, there may be some refusals. This text tells us that some decided they would not walk in the Lord's will, and they would not walk in the Lord's path. The results of their choice is chastisement and destruction. Beginning in verse 17 all the way to the end of the chapter, he starts talking about what all is going to happen to them. Now, why did they refuse? Either the way maybe was too narrow, or they felt that God just didn't know what he was talking about, or they thought that God was old-fashioned. But you know what? No matter what the world does, as the people of God, we ought to be willing to stand in the old way. I mean, we ought to be unashamed of who we are uh, and, and what we've accomplished. Let's hold our heads high. Let's walk in the way that God has ordained without apology, without backing down. Let's just be everything God commanded us to be in his word. Now, granted, the old way is not popular. And I hear all the time, young people won't go the old way. Well, if they want God's blessings, they will. Uh, if not, that's their choice. And because they choose not to follow God doesn't mean that you need to choose that. You see, folks, it's being abandoned daily by people who've decided that new is better. You know, it's funny, people have always been that way. Remember the Edsel by Ford? They thought new was better. I remember my uncle bought one. A few years later, he couldn't resell it. Nobody wanted it. Uh, it was junk. Uh, you know, new's not always better. Uh, and yet today, people are leaving the Bible. They're leaving the hymns. Uh, they're really not praising God. They're no longer worshiping God. Seeker services. Uh, are replacing the worship of the Lord God, and yet God has not changed. The enemies are changing the sign, but God has not changed. He knows the way, and if you ask him, he'll lead you. In the Alps, there's a religious pilgrimage. It's called the Stations of the Cross. Every year, thousands of people make this really tedious climb up that mountain, and they visit different places that commemorate the various places where Jesus was visited on his crucifixion march to Golgotha. One day, a tourist made the climb. He visited every station along the path, but when he got to the, the cross, he noticed a little trail that led off through the bushes. And he was curious, so he fought his way through the, the rough thicket, and to his surprise, he came to another shrine. It was a shrine that symbolized the empty tomb. It was neglected. The brush had grown up around it. Almost everyone went only as far as the cross, and that's where they stopped. Folks, that's what happens to many people. They stop at the cross, and they go no further. They see Jesus crucified, but they don't want to make the decision to follow him and to stand for him and to live for him. It's a tough decision, but you have to make it. I remember an old preacher <clears throat> was preaching his last message, and uh, he went on and on like I have. Then he came to the end, and I want to end it the way he did. He said, folks, the most important thing I can tell you is this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, 
Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. <clears throat> it's because Jesus loves you that we're here today. We want to tell you, he loved you so much that he went to the cross and gave his life and his blood so that you can have your sins forgiven, washed away. You know, when God forgives you, he never brings it up again. He washes it all away. He says, all right, you've got a new slate. You get to start over. Some of you sitting here today perhaps need that new slate. You don't know for certain that your sins have been forgiven. You don't know for sure you're on your way to heaven. But you'd like to know it. You'd like to be sure of it. In just a couple moments, the instruments are going to begin to play an invitation song. If you're not sure that you're on your way to heaven, I want to encourage you to slip out and come and meet me here and let one of our folks share with you how, what the Bible says, how you can be certain all of your sins have been forgiven. Christian, God's spoken to your heart because it's time for you to make a decision. It's time for you to decide what path you're going to take as individuals and obviously as a church you're going to have to make that decision God's spoken to your heart you need to slip out and come to the altar the way folks used to and get on your knees before him in tears and ask him to help you to stand in the right way the old paths ask him to help you 